Hey, I'm Josh, and for the early part of my life, my experience with the Bible was more or less that this was a list of do's and don'ts. I understood in here all the things that I was told what to do, what not to do, and all of the ways that I had to be responsible for those things. It wasn't until probably much later in my experience around the church and around the Word of God that this became alive for me. It became God's love letter for me. A core conviction grew out of that, that this wasn't just what I was responsible for, but what the Spirit of God wanted to do in me and through me. And so this became less about a manual and more about relationship, that God's love letter to all of humanity was for me. And that core conviction that God's been chasing me down and expressing who he is and who I am through his word, that it's become a daily practice for me to come back to this thing every single day to set the foundation of my life on who God is, who he's called me to, do, to be, and how he wants to transform my life through his word. Come on, it's a good day to be at church. Welcome to Vox. If you're new, my name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor. Thank you for being here today. We are so honored to gather with you today and lift up the name of Jesus. We're in a teaching series called Convictions, right? Looking at these foundational beliefs that really do form our faith, become the anchor points for our faith. And we've been looking at them through the Apostles' Creed, this ancient document written outside the Bible, right? It's not scripture, but it really does collect the New Testament teachings about convictions for those that follow Christ. And so I want to read the Apostles' Creed with you today. We've been reading it every single week for the last number of weeks. It says this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell on the third day. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Somebody say amen. 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 Convictions, powerful truths, all packed into this little section of, uh, of this creed. Incredible. We looked at week one at this idea of being a believer. What does it mean to be a believer, to be a person who believes, a person of faith? And then in week two, Sean talked to us about the Father Almighty, right? If you remember this, he talked about the tension between God being close and present like a father and also God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And then we looked at the Son, the Son, and how Christ and what he's done for us really does change everything in our relationship with God, that he is the great bridge. And then last week, if you were here, we uh, heard from Mike who talked about what Christ did in his resurrection as he entered into death for us and then rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And my hope is that as we've been through these first four convictions, now moving into the fifth conviction that is outlined in the Apostles' Creed, that it's beginning to shape you a little bit. It's beginning to challenge you a little bit because the goal of this whole series is to force us to ask the question question, you know, what do I really believe? And if I believe this, how should that change the way I live? How should it change the way I look at my life and the way I look at my future and the way I look at what I value? And so hopefully these convictions are starting to challenge you, starting to ask some questions and press you to decide what is it that you really do believe? Because my big dream, my big passion is that out of these core convictions really does form a holy alternate community, a people of God that might look on the outside just like everybody else, but on the inside, we're driven by a different vision, a different hope, a different joy, and it's rooted in the truth of what God's revealed in his word. And so that brings us kind of right now to this next phrase in the Apostles' Creed, one of my favorite. It says, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. If you remember the 1990s, there was a Western called The Quick and the Dead. And they, I think they were talking about quick, you know. But this isn't talking about how quick you can draw your gun. It's talking about the alive and the dead. That there will be a day where Christ comes and that the dead and the living are judged. And so what are the implications of that? What does it mean? And how should it affect our lives? I want to be today studying 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul where he talks about the implications of the second coming of Jesus. We're going to explore it together today, and it's an incredibly exciting text. Look at it with me, verse 13 of chapter 4. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, 
Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet them in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. I want to speak just for a few minutes today under the heading, He will come. He will come. Would you pray with me? Open your heart to God. Let's invite Him to speak to us. God, I thank you for this day, that we come, each of us, from a different place, with different circumstances, and yet your word is just as relevant and just as powerful. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd make yourself known today. We invite you to be among us as the gathered church, the body of Christ, lifts up the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would be a present help in a time of need, that you'd meet each of us in a personal way in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Maranatha. Maranatha. If you've been around church for any length of time, maybe you've heard that word before. Maranatha. It was a word that was used in the early church as a greeting. As a greeting when Christians came together. It's an Aramaic word. It appears one time in the New Testament, and scholars have debated its translation, Maranatha. It's a combination of two words, Maranatha. Maranatha, it means our Lord has come. Maranatha, that's a profound truth that our Lord has come. It's at the center of Christianity, right? That we believe that God came. That he became flesh, lived among us, died a death for our sins and rose from the dead. Our Lord has come. But if you separate the word a little differently, it actually changes the meaning. So if it's marina, tha, marina, tha, now the word can be translated, our Lord is coming. Our Lord is coming. And so for years, many have struggled with the translation of this word. What does maranatha mean? Does it mean our Lord has come or does it mean our Lord is coming? Coming, And I want to suggest to you that Paul chose the word for its ambiguity because he wanted us to understand that these are the twin hopes of the Christian life, that we believe that Christ has come, but we also believe that Christ is coming. And many Christians have developed an ideology or a philosophy of life based on the truth that Christ has come. But many of us have lived our lives really untouched by the truth that Christ is coming. So I want to ask you today, how has the truth of the second coming of Christ changed your life? Is it real to you? Is it something you think about? Something you've considered? Something that influences the way that you live? Do you even know what you really believe about this? And what does the Bible actually teach about the return of Jesus Christ? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 addresses the question directly, and Paul starts with this concern that you and I might be uninformed, right? He says, I don't want you to be uninformed about this because he knows a lot of our deepest issues actually come from misinformation. And so that deep depression, that deep anxiety, that deep fear is often rooted in something that we don't yet know, some piece of information that we need to know about God and about how he sees the world and about his truth. And so he says, it's so important that you are informed. But then he takes on directly this topic of grief and loss. And this is very important because he wants us to know that grief and loss are an actual part of every person's life. And we live in this world sometimes under the assumption that we can avoid grief and we can avoid loss. But I don't know about you, last time I checked, 100 out of 100 people are dying. And so every one of us at one point in our journey of life is going to face death. And the truth is, for most of us, people you love will die before you die. And so you're going to need to process the loss and the grief that comes with those deaths. And so how do you process grief and loss? Do you have any way of thinking about this? What will you do? When grief knocks on your door, think about your life right now. I think for many of us, this is not a theoretical question. It is a very tangible, very personal question. What will you do when grief knocks on your door? Because you've lost someone. Maybe you've lost a relationship. Maybe you've lost a family member or a friend, a mom or a dad or both, or a husband or a wife or even a child. And it's changed you. You know, it's shaped the way you live. Think about your life. Think about the losses that you've experienced Surely they've changed you. They've impacted you. How do you process that grief? 
Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the famous psychiatrist, outlined five stages of grief, right? You may be familiar with them. They're relatively well-known, but it starts with denial, and then from denial to anger, and then bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And it's interesting because people can get stuck in those stages, right? So we can get stuck in that place of depression, or we can get stuck in that place of anger and not move beyond them. And so we're living in a world right now that does not have a real answer for processing death or processing loss. So just think about it. The world around you, tragically, many of the greatest minds don't answer the question of grief and loss. They don't answer the question of death. They tell us, actually, many of the greatest minds, that there's nothing after death, that your body's going to decompose, that you will be forgotten, that the world will move on, that we are just organisms, that we are just computers whose batteries eventually run out and life moves on. The famous scientist Stephen Hawking said that the afterlife is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. Carl Sagan said the afterlife is just wishful thinking. And so we're told by many of the greatest minds that death is natural. Death is just a natural part of life, that one day your heart will stop beating, you will cease to exist, your body will decompose, and you will be fertilizer for the grass and the flowers. So what do you believe? What do you believe about life? And what do you believe about death? Pretty significant, pretty important questions. You remember The Lion King? where we all learned about the circle of life. Come on, you've seen The Lion King, right? We all learned about the circle of life, the circle of life, and there was, the, there was the antelope who eat the grass, and then the lions eat the antelope, and then the lions die and decompose and become the grass, and then the antelope eat the lions, sort of, but now they're grass, and, and the whole thing just goes on and on and on. I don't know if you actually paid attention during The Lion King, but when Mufasa is killed, and the pride lands go into disarray, and all types of craziness is breaking loose, and Simba is dealing with the death of his his dad and the guilt and the remorse and the shame and the fear and all the things. I don't think anybody's watching that movie just going, well, it's just a circle of life. It's just a circle. No, no. We're like, this is wrong. This is terrible. This is a tragedy, right? Something is being stolen. Something is being taken. Death is an intruder. Death is a thief. See, there's something inside every human psyche that knows that you were not created simply to die and drift off into dust and become fertilizer for the grass. You were not created to just be forgotten, to grow weaker and weaker, and then one day shuffle off this mortal coil. And to convince yourself that death is something that's completely natural is to deny something essentially human about you, that you were hardwired to desire a love Love that lasts forever. You want to live. There's something in you. Come on, be honest. There's something in you that longs to be alive, that longs to be loved, and that longs for that love to transcend this life. Come on, somebody say amen. It's true. It's true. Go ahead, turn to that person next to you and say, I want to live. Come on, let's, I want to live. I want to live. I do. I do. I remember the first time I went to a funeral and I was looking at the body of my family member. And they were gone. And I can remember just being there as a young kid and, and looking at this body in the casket and somebody just saying, oh, doesn't he look so peaceful? And I remember just looking at him and thinking, just even as a little kid, no. <laughs> he looks gone. He looks gone. He looks like he's not there anymore. See, we know at our core, death is an offense. Death is a monstrosity. We want to live. And we want the people we love to live. Why are we denying this? I don't want to become fertilizer. The scripture says that God has set eternity in your heart. He set eternity in your heart because death is not a part of God's original design. It's not. It's an intruder. It's a thief. When Jesus attended a funeral, right, he goes to the funeral in John chapter 11, and he doesn't look at everybody and say, hey, get over it, kids. It's the natural part of life. It's the circle of life. No. He looks at it, and he weeps, and he rages. When Job hears that his kids have died tragically, he doesn't just say, oh, it's just a circle of life. No, Job tears his garments and mourns for days. And the scripture says, in all of this, Job sinned not. See, death is the result of sin. And sin was brought on through the curse, through rebellion in mankind. But Christ came to undo death and conquer it for us. But tragically, many Christians don't really have a way of dealing or processing with death well. And so oftentimes, Christians will feel guilty, mourning, and grieving. We're told, well, they're in heaven, so don't mourn, celebrate. Celebrate. And so we have sometimes these awkward celebrations. No, no, it's a celebration. It's celebra but everybody's hurting. Everybody's broken. Everybody's sad. And we don't know how to deal with death. And so some Christians actually feel guilty, feeling bad, or feeling sad. 
And it's so important here to understand in 1 Thessalonians 4 that Paul does not say it's wrong to mourn. Christians should mourn and grieve when someone we lose dies. But he tells us that our grief is different. Our grief is more complex. That in one hand, we are sorrowful and sad for the loss, and we should be. Christ was, Job was, the scripture testifies that we should be. But at the same time that we mourn and grieve, the complexity of our grief includes a supernatural hope that they are not gone and that I will see them again. Amen. It's mingled with hope. And so here in the text, Paul calls those who have died asleep, asleep. And that has led some to believe in what theologians call soul sleep, the idea that you are unconscious after death until the return of Christ, and then you are brought back to life. But in all that time, you are in some type of an unconscious soul sleep. I want to encourage your heart. That is not what the New Testament teaches. That's not what he means when he says asleep. He's talking about the physical body dying. It looks like they're sleeping, but you are not, in fact, gone. In fact, Paul speaks of it directly in 2 Corinthians 5. He says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He doesn't want you to be confused about it. He's very explicit. You will be present with the Lord. Every believer in Christ, as soon as you're absent from your body, you will be present with the Lord. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and the thief next to him said, remember me in your coming kingdom, Jesus said, today... You'll be with me in paradise. Not six months from now, not 100 years from now, not 10,000 years from now. Today, today. In other words, though your body may die, your soul, your disembodied soul will be conscious and aware and in the presence of God from the instant that you leave your flesh. That's good news. That's good news. You got to decide what you believe about these things. Because heaven, according to the Bible, is not the end of the story. And a lot of Christians really don't think much past this. We go, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to go to heaven and we'll probably like sit on clouds and like, you know, I don't know, like floating. No, no, that's not what it describes. Yes, you'll be in the presence of the Lord, conscious, aware. But then something's going to happen next. History is heading somewhere. It's not just one big circle. The day will come where God fully reveals himself to the world and a new era in human history will begin. And the text describes it. It's pretty incredible. It says, first, Christ is going to give a command. What is that going to sound like? What is that going to feel like, that moment? And then there's going to be this voice of an archangel breaking through the clouds. And then we're told, after the archangel speaks, there's going to be a sound that fills the whole earth. And it's described as the trumpet of God. What will that sound like? You know, I don't know exactly what it will sound like. Maybe you hear that and you think, oh, well, that, that feels a little silly. You know, it feels a little, you maybe, maybe you're even a little embarrassed about these types of scriptures because they just feel a little, little pie in the sky, a little silly. I want to I just press you on that because the New Testament writers, they did not feel embarrassed about this. They did not treat the return of Jesus as something to kind of push off to the side as a side issue. In fact, the second coming of Christ was an absolutely central issue to New Testament believers. It's mentioned over 300 times in the New Testament. One out of every 13 verses in the New Testament refers back to the second coming of Jesus because these people understood that what you believe about the future has tremendous power to shape your present. And you're believing something about the future right now. Whether you've identified it or clarified it is up to you. You're not maybe sure even what you believe about the future, but that uncertainty is informing your life. No matter what you believe about the future, it has implications for your present way of living. And they knew this, and it was critical that you understand what you actually believe is to come. So what do you believe? What do you believe? Revelation 1-7, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. 
2 Peter 3, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. There's that language again. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. These texts litter the entire Bible. The prophets of old spoke of it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jesus spoke of it often. Paul spoke of it often because it was central to their way of life. Maranatha, our Lord has come. Our Lord is coming. What will happen on that day? What will happen on the day of the Lord? Well, we're told directly that every eye will see him, Revelation 1-7. Every eye will see him. It's not going to be a secret. It's going to be very, very present for all the millions of millions of people on the earth. But throughout the history of the church, theologians have debated the sequence of these events. Some conclude that Jesus will return and remove the church from the world. They call this the rapture. Some think there'll be seven years of tribulation and then this rapture. Others say the church will remain until Christ returns. No matter the sequence of events, and theologians have debated it for years, the final result is the same, that when he comes, verse 17 makes it clear, we will always be with the Lord. And so I want to share my perspective on 1 Thessalonians 4, and you can wrestle with it on your own. But look at the text with me again, and let's try to understand what Jesus wants us to know about his return. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, try to follow the logic, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. Speaking of those who've died, he's saying they're going to return with Christ. For this we declare to you by a word of the Lord, that those who are alive, that's you and me as of today, right, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who've fallen asleep. Okay, so we're going to see them at the same time they see them. We're not going to skip ahead. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, the sound of a trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, so the dead are going to rise. Then we who are alive, that's you and I, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. So first we're told that those who died will come with Christ upon his return. Then it says a few verses later that they're going to rise. So I take this to mean that at the moment that Christ returns, all believers who have died will receive their new bodies and be with Jesus in that moment. Now, if you've been with us these last few weeks, we've talked about this. Christ is the first fruits of a new creation. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with a resurrected eternal body, right? A body that would not ever die again. So he plans to give all those who believe a body like that. And so all believers who have died will receive that upon his return. So he's going to collect somehow mysteriously all the molecules of your body. Maybe they dissolved in the ground. Maybe they were eaten by a fish, but he's going to somehow supernaturally collect them all. And he's going to reframe for you a new eternal body. And then you're going to rise. First Corinthians 15 describes it. Look, listen, I tell you a mystery. This can be a little mysterious. We will not all sleep or die, but we'll all be changed in a flash. Flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. There's that trumpet again. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. That means you now have an eternal body and we will be changed. So you're going to receive an eternal body if you're alive, or if you've died, you're going to be reunited with your body. Philippians 3, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Friend, you're not going to be a disembodied spirit for all eternity. You are actually going to be physically alive again from the dead. So in an instant, those who have died will be reunited with their bodies and those who are alive will be changed into resurrected bodies. And then we're going to meet the Lord in the air. All right. You following this so far? This is significant. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And the question then is, where are we going now? Now that we met him in the air, what happens next? Some conclude from this passage that the church is then going to go to heaven and the world is going to go through a time of trial. And it could be that, but I don't think that's what the text is teaching. And let me try to tell you why. The scripture says here that we are going to meet the Lord in the air by saying meet, meet, right? So meeting the Lord in the air, that word is not the common word that is used for meet. In fact, it's only used two other times in the New Testament. It's a very specific word. It's a noun. It means we're going to have a meeting 
with the Lord. But that specific noun has some specific implications. It describes the arrival of a dignitary or an emperor who comes to a city and the people hearing that he is coming go out to meet him before he arrives at the city. And then they welcome him. They become his entourage back into the city in which they came. And so we see this both times it's used in the New Testament. It's used in this way. One is the parable of the 10 virgins where the virgins go out to meet the bridegroom and bring him right back into the wedding ceremony. Another time is where people go out to meet Paul and then they immediately return back to the city that they came. And so I take this to mean that all believers, dead and alive, will meet Christ upon his return in the air and then come down with him to the earth as he inaugurates a new era on earth. And so the Bible describes a series of events that will happen at that point and it will culminate in what's known as the final judgment. The final judgment. And Revelation chapter 20 describes it. Look at it with me. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up its dead. The death and grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So Revelation 20 is describing Judgment Day, a day of reckoning, a day when all things will be exposed. And it's important to note here that no one skips this moment. No one. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5 is explicit about it. It says, look, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Are you starting to see how what you believe about the future must impact the way you live today? See, it's critical that we have a clear conviction about this. What do you believe? I wonder how much the truth of the second coming of Christ has actually changed your life or impacted the way you think about your plans, your future, your dreams, your desires. I think if we're honest, for many of us, the idea of a judgment day is very, very uncomfortable for a lot of reasons, but some of it is just cultural. We don't like the idea of being judged. You know, our postmodern worldview tells us that, you know, I don't, really, I don't really like the idea of a God who judges. I like a God who loves everybody, and I don't, I don't see how God could be loving and condemn people to hell, you know? And so we've embraced what, you know, many have called expressive individualism, this idea that, that truth is relative to my individual perspective. What I believe about truth is the most important thing, and no one can have a final say over my life. And so we often imagine a God who accepts everyone, you know, judges no one. But you remember the second commandment, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, where it says you'll not make God into an image. The first commandment talks about God's supremacy, no other gods before me. But the second commandment speaks of our tendency to reimagine God on our terms. That there's something in the human heart that likes to recreate God in the way that we like him, not in the way that he's revealed himself. And so we create a God that is perfectly loving but is not just. And what we're ending up doing without realizing it is creating a world that doesn't work because there is wickedness, there is evil, there is sin in this world, and justice demands that that is held accountable for. And so nobody wants to live in a world where corruption and evil go unjudged, where wickedness is not dealt with. So the idea of God being loving but not being just does not work in real life. The scripture, however, describes a Bible, in the Bible a picture of God who is a collision of things that seem contradictory at first glance, that he's perfectly holy without sin in any way and yet perfectly loving and this is where the cross brings us close I love how Dr. Tim Keller says it look at it. he says I found no other religious text outside the Bible that said God created the world out of love and delight so you can read the Quran you can read the teachings of Buddha you're not going to find a God who created out of love I must conclude that the source of the idea that God is love is the Bible itself and the Bible tells us that the God of love is also a God of judgment who will put all things in the world to rights in the end. And so there is a God who is both perfectly loving and perfectly just. And that means that one day I will give an account for my life. And so will you. This is the clear teaching of scripture. And it must change us. It must change us. You know, the other day I was talking with my son. He's a freshman in high school. And he gets really good grades. 
very proud of him. He's perfect in every way. And, um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we were just, we were talking, and it's finals time, freshman year, you know, kind of first, first time he's really doing finals. And so I said, I said, hey, uh, I said, hey, you know, finals are coming up. How are you feeling? How are you feeling about finals? And he goes, eh, I don't really care. And right away, I like clicked into dad mode. I was like, what? I was like, son, you need to care. You need to care. Son, you're a freshman. This isn't middle school anymore. This isn't elementary. You need to care. Son, you need to care. This will go on your transcript. This is important. This is significant. It's going to determine the college. You better, you better figure this out, son. You need to care. Son, this is important. He goes, all right, dad, I care. I care a lot. I really do. I definitely care. I was like, I don't know if I won that one. But, but it's an important thought to consider that your life has a transcript, that your life is being recorded, that you need to care. That it matters. It matters how you talk to that person. It matters how you treat that person. It matters what you do when no one's watching. It matters. All of it matters. Your life has a transcript. And this is where I think it gets a little murky for Christians. We get a little confused because we believe in the doctrine of grace. That is the foundation of the Christian faith. In fact, no other faith offers that mysterious, glorious, powerful, life-changing truth that you cannot get to God on your own, but that Christ on your behalf led you to God, that he came and lived the life you could not, died the death that you deserved, and became a bridge so that by faith in him, you could be accepted fully forever forgiven. For by grace you have been saved through faith not the result of works so that no one can boast. And so we are not saved on the merits of our own life. We are saved on the merits of Christ's life. And by trusting him, this is our hope. This is our joy. This is our life. So how can we be judged for our deeds and received by his grace at the same time? And that's why Revelation tells us that there's more than one book. Did you catch that? There's more than one book. It says that the books were opened. The books are what record all that you've done. And then it says the book will be opened. And that's the Lamb's book of life. And so Jesus tells us in John 3, 16, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He tells us in Luke 10, rejoice because your name is written in heaven. And so when you trust in Christ, believe in his sacrifice, surrender your heart to his lordship, now your name is written on the merits of Jesus in the Lamb's book of life. Your name is written in his book in heaven, but then on judgment day, God will open the books so Okay, those books that recorded all that you've done and the record of your life will serve as the evidence of your faith in Christ. That's an important distinction. The record of your life will serve as the evidence of your faith in Christ. This doesn't mean that your good deeds will outweigh your bad, right? Oh, well, 51% good, 49% bad, he's in. No, 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 that's not how it works. That's, remember, I mean, think about the thief on the cross. That's not how it worked for him, right? But... It does mean that genuine faith always leads to genuine change. James said it like this, faith without works is dead. In other words, the power of grace in your heart will always be evident in your life. And so good deeds are not the basis of your salvation, but they are the evidence of your salvation. And so God will open up the books and he will mark the change that's occurred in you and that change occurred by the gospel grace in your heart is the necessary fruit of justifying faith. One theologian said it like this, amen. That's huge. So important for us to know our convictions. Said it like this, no one is saved on the basis of his works, but everyone who is saved does new works. Not perfectly, but with humble longing for more holiness. Humble longing for more holiness. That's a good question for you today. Do you find within yourself a humble longing for more holiness? Do you find within yourself a desire to honor God and obey him? A desire to submit to him? Do you find within yourself Christ changing you, making you more loving towards him and towards others month after month, year after year? Do you find a growing love before God? and others, because this is where you can find assurance, which, by the way, is what your heart needs most. Assurance, not that you're sinless, but that God is working in you, changing you, growing you. And if you see the evidence of God working in you, then my encouragement to you is continue in your faith because one day you will stand before God and he will welcome you home. He will open his Lamb's book of life 
and your name will in fact be recorded in it. And then he'll open the books of your life and he'll show how through your life of faith you evidenced convictions of his grace. It's huge. So consider the implications of what we've discussed so far, right? First of all, that those who die are not in fact gone. That's, that's massive. That's life-changing. Secondly, that history will one day be interrupted with the sound of a trumpet. And then lastly, that you'll stand before God, you'll give an account for your life. Verse 2 of chapter 5 says, For the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. Just uh, this past week, my wife and I, Chrissy and I, we got back from Israel. And just an incredible trip. And Israel is 12-hour time change difference. And so we landed Tuesday morning which for us was like the end of the day, but here it was four in the morning. So we've been a little confused, waking up at weird times. You know how that is if you've ever done the time change thing. It's, it's kooky for a few days. And, and so we've been waking up at weird hours. And, and so, uh, you know, I haven't gotten a ton of sleep these last number of days. But, but a couple nights ago, I was sort of up and down, and it's probably four in the morning, and I am like dead asleep, like dead asleep, like in a different galaxy of sleep. You know how that is? Like you're just completely gone. And I get woken up from someone tapping on my forehead. Pop, 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 pop. And I shot out of bed like there was a, like the trumpet just went off. You know, I just like, boom, I just got up and I was like, hoo -yah! You know, like, I like, like, who is, you know, who is that? You know, it just like woke me up, like, boom, woke me up. And it was my eight-year-old son, Ezra. He's like, oh, you know, he's like, oh, oh, sorry, buddy. What's going on? I'm sorry. I was like in a different world. What's going on? He goes, oh, dad, I couldn't sleep. I said, all right, go tell your mom, <laughs> you know. And uh, still working on the holiness thing. But, you know, go, go tell her she can deal with it. You know, and, and no, I, I kind of helped him and helped him find mom and, and, and away we go. But, but he, he, he jolted me awake, you know. And so here the text tells us, and it's a common refrain when speaking about the return of Christ, that, that Christ will come like a thief in the night, right? Like a thief in the night. What's that supposed to tell us? It's supposed to tell us that he will surprise us. That it's not when the Mayan calendar says it is. It's not when the documentary you watch on Netflix says it is. It's not when that spooky guy on YouTube says it is. It's not any of those things, all right? It's when no one expects it. No one knows the day or the hour. All we know is that right now, at this exact moment in time, we are closer to the return of Christ than ever before. That's what we know. We know that for a fact. And so if this is true, how should we live? What are the implications of this truth? I want to give you two. Implication number one, live your life with a holy urgency. With a holy, I didn't say a panic. I didn't say a fear. I said a holy urgency. I didn't say sell all that you have and live in a tent, you know, and wait for the, the sky to break open. No, that's not what I said. But I did say with a holy urgency. In other words, Christians should not put off till tomorrow what we know we should do today. That is an unbiblical way to live in light of Christ's return. You should not avoid that difficult conversation just because it's difficult. Oh, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I'll deal with it another day. No, you need to deal with it now. Stop being unwilling to deal with something God's called you to do now. And so is there somebody you need to apologize to? Is there somebody you need to forgive? Is there something that you're delaying that you know God has called you to do? Sam Storm says it like this. He says, careful reflection on Christ's return, sustained meditation on what it will mean in that moment for all eternity has a purifying effect on the soul. It turns sin sour in our mouths and serves to conform us evermore to the image of Jesus himself. C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said, precisely because we cannot predict the moment, we must be ready at all moments. So are you? Do you live that way? Has this conviction translated into your actual life? Or is there a sin in your life that you're hiding and then you're just tolerating? Is there a conversation with someone about Jesus that you know God has called you to have, but you're just waiting for the perfect time? Friend, perfect times don't exist in this life. Now's the time. Now's the time. This is the time. Stop waiting for a perfect time and obey the Lord now. Is there something he's called you to do that you've been hesitant, unwilling, or been delaying? And you already know he's called you to do it. Now's the time. Receive this today as a word of the Lord. Now's the time. Don't delay when he's made clear his heart and his will. Obey him now. That's an implication of his return. Live with a holy urgency. Number two, live today from a place of hope. This one is so precious. Live today from a place of hope. I know it sounds simple, but the implications of this are just so far reaching. What do you really believe about all this? 
Have you determined it? Have you decided? Do you believe in God? Do you believe that Christ came as God in the flesh and made a sacrifice for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again? Do you believe that he will return just as he said he would? Do you believe in eternal life? Do you believe that you'll see your loved ones again? Are these things that you believe? Because if you believe these things, then there is a hope for you that really does change all of life. You can live hopeful in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a bad report, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of injustice. A day will come when all things are made right. And this life is fleeting. But tomorrow you'll open your eyes into an eternity. And then the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised. You'll stand before God and you'll enter into the joy of his kingdom. This is real. Are you living with an assurance like that? You know, I believe that every Christian can live with a supernatural assurance. Assurance about the future. And it's that assurance that should change us. That should make us a little different than the world around us. But assurance like that requires that you reflect on your convictions. And then you take that step of faith to determine, I'm going to believe this. I've got my doubts. I've got my questions. But I'm going to believe this. And I'm going to live like it's true. First Thessalonians 4.18 Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Would you stand with me? I think God wants to get your attention today. Maranatha. It means the Lord came. Maranatha, it means the Lord is coming. But then there's actually a third, believe it or not, a third translation of the word Maranatha. And actually the third translation is my favorite one. Maranatha can be translated as a prayer. It can be translated, Our Lord, come. Our Lord, come. And that's my prayer for us today. Our Lord, come. That God would meet you right now. So I want to invite you to do something with me. Just take a moment, bow your head, and close your eyes for an opportunity for some personal reflection, for some personal inventory. What do you believe? And has it changed the way that you live? Are you living today with a holy urgency? Or is right now God calling you to wake up? God calling you to run from that thing? that you know is holding you back. God calling you to obey him in that area that you've been delaying. Where is God calling you to wake up now? A holy urgency. Are you living from a place of supernatural hope? Or has hopelessness crept in? Maybe you're here and that relationship fell apart. That future plan fell apart. That loved one passed away. And it's been months, it's been years, it's been decades, and it's still holding you back. Has hopelessness crept into your soul? Because today God wants to meet you and heal you. Supernatural hope. It's available to you right now. And so I want to pray, Maranatha, our Lord, come. Our Lord, come and reveal yourself as present even now. Even now, before the trumpet sounds. Reveal yourself, Lord, as present in our lives and ignite our hearts with a holy urgency and a supernatural hope. Would you pray that with me today? Father, in the name of Jesus, you know the details, you know the story. You know the specifics. And so we pray, Maranatha, we pray that you would come right now, 
that you would manifest yourself as a present help in a time of need. That you would reveal Jesus to our hearts and that you would inject our veins with a holy urgency in light of the truth of your coming. We pray in Jesus' name that even right now you would give us a supernatural assurance that I will see them again, that this life is not the end, a hope that changes the way that we live. Lord, fill our hearts so much so that it conquers fear and hopelessness. Lord, I pray that even now as we sing and as we worship, you would meet us in a profound way and you would change us in ways incalculable where we can't even measure the impact or the degrees, but we know surely I've touched heaven and it's changed my heart. Lord, I pray do that even now in Jesus' name.